Hi, and welcome to Lockdown Learning with Guardians of the Deep. I'm Sally, and this week we'll be exploring Antarctica. You'll be able to answer most of these questions by the end of this presentation. The penguin quiz is dedicated to those living in the Antarctic, while the seal quiz covers southern hemisphere species. Both quizzes can be found on the Lockdown Learning page of my website, scientistinlimbo.com. You can pause the video now if you'd like to make a note of these questions so that you can answer them as we move through the presentation. Antarctica is an incredible place. It is the southernmost continent and is the coldest, driest, windiest place on Earth. During summer, it is 14.2 million square kilometers, twice the size of Australia, and it lies beneath a gigantic sheet of ice that is four kilometers thick in some parts. Due to the sea ice that forms around the coasts, Antarctica effectively doubles in size during winter, making it four times the size of Australia. If you have a look at the diagram on the right, you'll see two pictures of Antarctica. The left one is a depiction of the sea ice extent in February 2019, which would be the summer extent of the, the melted sea ice. And the depiction on the right, September 2019, shows the winter extent of the sea ice. At this point, Antarctica is four times the size of Australia, which is massive. You'll also note the orange line that fringes the sea ice. This is the median extent during 1981 to, to, to 2010. So you'll see that there is, there is a decrease in the overall covering of sea ice. Mount Erebus and Deception Island are the two active volcanoes found in Antarctica, while at least 91 more volcanoes lie beneath the ice, making it the largest volcano range on Earth. There is also evidence of a meteor impact, the 482 kilometer wide crater dating back 250 million years. This impact wiped out almost all life on Earth, and the size, location, and timing suggests it contributed to the breaking up of Gondwana land. Gondwana land being the name of the southern half of the Pangaean supercontinent, Laurasia being its northern counterpart. Nobody owns Antarctica. It is governed as a national, an, sorry, it's governed as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science as guided by the Antarctic Treaty System, an international governance framework for the Antarctic and Southern Ocean. These agreements regulate international relations for the continent. Signed by the original 12 countries on the 1st of December 1959, it came into force on the 23rd of June 1961. It now has 54 signatories and works to protect the fragile Antarctic ecosystem. Antarctica's climatic conditions vary slightly between the interior, the coasts, and the peninsula. Its average annual temperature ranges between minus 60 and minus 10 degrees, with the lowest ever temperature of minus 89.2 degrees Celsius being recorded in 1983. This year, 2020, saw the highest temperatures on record hitting the continent at 20.75 degrees Celsius. Sunlight is affected by the tilt of the Earth's axis, resulting in the sun at the poles spending six months above the horizon and six months below the horizon. This means that during the middle of winter, there is no sunlight. And conversely, during the middle of summer, there is no darkness. With a precipitation average of 166 millimeters per year, Antarctica is classed as a desert, which is a region receiving less than 254 millimeters of annual precipitation. Precipitation is a form of condensation of atmospheric water vapor, and this includes drizzle, rain, sleet, snow, etc. In Antarctica, precipitation mainly falls as snow, 
with rainfall being rare and usually only falling along the coasts and on the peninsula. It, it often appears as though more snow is falling than there really is, but this is just because strong winds blow around the already fallen snow, which can result in a blizzard. These blizzards cause whiteout conditions that are very disorientating with badly limited visibility, not allowing you to see any distinguishable features. The strong winds of Antarctica are called the catabatics, and these occur when cold, dense air flows out from the polar plateau of the interior and down the steep vertical drops along the coast. This means that while there are strong winds at the coast, the winds are relatively mild further inland. July 1972 currently holds the record for the strongest wind ever recorded, 327 kilometers an hour. And you think Cape Town Southeast is bad. The temperature a person feels as a result of the air temperature and wind is called wind chill. I took this photo of a wind chill chart on the Monkey Island of the S.A. Gullis 2. It shows that the, what the temperature feels, it shows the temperature feels colder when you add wind. It also shows the danger you could be in if you don't dress properly to insulate yourself. For example, if the temperature is only minus 12 degrees Celsius, but you are experiencing a 35 knot wind, the temperature could feel as cold as min minus 37 degrees Celsius, which is very cold. We are now going to have a look at some of the awesome species that make Antarctica their home. Don't forget about your quiz questions. We'll start with the penguins. There are four species that live in Antarctica. The emperor and Adeli breed on the shores of the continent, while the chinstrap breeds on the islands around Antarctica, and the gentoo can be found in the islands ranging from the Antarctic to the sub-Antarctic. Standing at 1.3 meters and weighing 23 kilograms, the emperor is the biggest of this group. Because of the difference in their size and location, predators are species dependent, especially for chicks, and they also vary whether the penguins are on land or at sea. Since penguins are restricted to the south and polar bears to the north, polar bears are not one of the pre their predators. Their land -based predators. The land-based predators of their chicks do, however, include birds such as the southern giant petrel, the south polar and Antarctic skuas, the kelp gull, and the snowy sheath bull. Adult penguins are vulnerable to the fur and leopard seals and killer whales. The most common prey group for these penguins is fish, but they also eat squid and crustaceans such as krill. Penguins have adapted a number of ways to keep warm in this harsh environment. Like whales and seals, penguins have a layer of blubber beneath their skin, and their dense feathers trap air close to their skin, which acts as an additional insulating layer. But what about their feet? These aren't covered with feathers or insulated with blubber. So instead, penguins have countercurrent heat exchanges at the tops of their legs. The heat flows from the warm blood coming from the heart to the cold blood coming from their feet. They can also control the rate of blood flowing to their feet. So this rate will reduce when it's cold. Penguin feet are therefore kept at a temperature a degree or two above freezing, which minimizes heat loss but avoids frostbite. While on land, a collection of penguins is called a colony, and while at sea, they are called a raft. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, uses a set of criteria to categorize the world's species in their red list of threatened species according to their risk of extinction. For penguins, their Delhi, Chinstrap, and Gentoo are listed as least concern, meaning they are not dependent on conservation efforts to survive. The emperor penguin, however, is listed as near threatened. This means exactly what it sounds like. The extent of the, the existence of this animal is close to being threatened, and they should regularly be evaluated so as not to be upgraded to vulnerable. 
So this picture is um, just uh, a collection of little penguin tracks. You can see the bit of confusion in the middle um, as they all ran away from this very big, scary looking red ship and jumped into the water. So you'll often see this in freshly fallen snow. It's very sweet. There are 36 sea and shorebird species that are found south of the Antarctic polar front and they can be divided into three categories. The ice obligate species are those that are year-round residents using the ice for roosting and breeding and foraging in the cracks between the flows. These include the Antarctic and snow petrels as well as the south polar skewer. Ice tolerant species are associated with the outer zone of loose pack ice nesting along the coast and commuting over sea ice. These species include the shorebirds, such as the cormorants, sheathbill, skewers and terns. Ice avoiding species like the albatross and other petrel species are associated with open water. Seabird chicks are vulnerable to predation from other seabird species while ad adults can fall prey to seals, especially the leopard seal. As with the penguins, prey is very much species dependent, but include fish, krill, penguin eggs and chicks. Some species like the skewers will scavenge the carcasses of seals, whales and penguins. While species such as the snowy sheath bull and the south polar skewer are classed as least concern, 19 of the 22 albatross species and more than half of the petrel species are currently threatened with extinction. This photograph is of a pintado or cape petrel. It's my favorite of the Southern Ocean birds. Um, pintado means painted in Spanish and you can see by the beautiful patterns on their wings as to how they got this name. Seals can be split into fur seals and true seals. The main differences being that fur seals have external ear flaps, big, big strong foreflippers that allow them to climb, sit upright and effectively walk on land, and rotating ankle joints that aid in land walking. Fur seals are much more agile on land than true seals. The six Antarctic species include the Antarctic fur, the crab eater, the leopard, the Ross, Southern Elephant and Weddell Seals, the majority being from the true seal group. Most seals feed on fish, krill and squid, while the leopard seal also feeds on seabirds, penguins and seal pups. Seal predators include the killer whale and for the smaller seal uh, species include the, the leopard seal as well. If you want to see something really cool, Look for a photo of the teeth of a crab eater seal. 95% of their diet is made up of krill and they use their interlocking sieve-like tooth structure to filter krill from the, from the seawater, much like the baleen in whales. The record for the deepest dive by any seal species is held by the southern elephant seal for diving to a depth of 2,000, sorry, diving to a depth of 2,388 meters. Their average dive depth is usually around the 1,550 meter mark, which is still, still fairly deep. The Ross seal, restricted to the thick pack ice of the Antarctic, is the least known of the Antarctic seal species. During my recent trip, scientists tagged two females in an effort to expand our knowledge of these small, albeit feisty, seals. While they were tagging them, the scientists took various samples, including whiskers. This will give biologists information about the movement patterns and dietary history of the seals. Eight species of whale live in the cold, nutrient-rich waters of the Antarctic. As with all whales, they fall within two categories. The Mr. Seats are the baleen whales and include the Antarctic blue, the Antarctic minke, the fin, humpback, si, and southern right whales. The Danta Seats are the toothed whales and include the killer whale and sperm whale. Baleen whales feel, feed mostly on krill, but also eat copepods, small fish, squid, and plankton. 
While the sperm whales hunt squid, killer whales hunt fish, seals, penguins, and baleen whales. Killer whales are the only natural predator for whales, and they can be split into different ecotypes. Ecotypes are distinct forms that differ in size, appearance, prey preference, foraging techniques, dialects, behaviors, and social groupings. Their ranges overlap, but they don't seem to interbreed. The killer whale e ecotypes for the Antarctic include A, associated with the open Southern Ocean following the minke migration into and out of Antarctic waters. B1, the pack ice ecotype, is found foraging for seals in the loose pack ice around the continent. B2, a smaller ecotype with a diet thought to primarily consist of penguins. And C, the Ross seal ecotype. No, sorry. <laughs> C is the Ross sea ecotype. Ross seal is something completely different. So the, the Ross sea ecotype is associated with the, pack, the thick pack ice of the Ross sea and is seen feeding and has been seen feeding on the Antarctic toothfish. The nutrient-rich waters swirling around Antarctica provide an incredibly fertile feeding ground. But the humpback and southern right whales, for example, prefer the warmer waters closer to the tropics in which to carve. South Africa celebrates the annual arrival of these two species, enjoying their spectacular breaching at sea and watching the newborns in our calm, protected bays. It wasn't always like this, however. 60 years of whaling in Antarctic waters decimated populations. 97% of the blue whale population was lost. But now, thanks to global protection and the establishment of marine protected areas, an ocean sanctuary such as the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary, whale numbers are recovering. The Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary was established by the IWC International Whaling Commission in 1994 and protects 50 million square kilometers. This year, 2020, saw a survey count 55 blue whale individuals, warranting a 2020 assessment of recovery by the IWC. Even with such awesome conservation efforts, Antarctica is still facing threats, climate change being at the forefront. A change in climate results in localized warming. Remember the highest temperature on record, 20.75 degrees Celsius was recorded this year. The alteration of ocean chemistry and the loss of sea ice. This loss changes the abundance, timing and location of phytoplankton blooms, impacting the crawl stocks and having knock-on effects throughout the Antarctic food web. Both legal fishing and illegal overfishing can have disastrous effects on the ecosystem as a whole. We have already seen a decrease of 80% in the krill stocks since 1991. Because of the change in climate, some invasive species are now able to survive where they shouldn't, having detrimental impacts on the environment. An increase in the disturbance and pollution associated with an increase in tourism has also been recorded as has an increase in pollution from surrounding regions. Microplastics and chemicals from thousands of kilometers away are being found in the Antarctic ice. Discarded, abandoned, or lost fishing gear continues to trap and kill wildlife and destroy habitat. The infrastructure associated with the building of research stations has al also has an environmental impact. The Antarctic Treaty System protects all plants and animals and prohibits mining and the discharge of waste. An amendment to the system, the Madrid Protocol, specifies that all Antarctic programs must clean up abandoned work sites and waste tips. Waste of all kinds should be returned to the country of origin where possible. Sled dogs were all removed from Antarctica by the 1st of April 1994 because of the fear that distemper could spread to the seals. No domestic animals of any kind are allowed in the region. The establishment of reserves, such as the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary, act to further safeguard the environment. 
environmental audits are now also carried out around scientific stations to assess the environmental impact. And a number of these bases are using alternative energy sources to lower this impact. Protected areas are being set up with varying degrees of restriction. For example, areas can be closed to vehicle, vehicles or people altogether, and some have a limit on the number of annual visitors. We have seen that what we do here, so far away from Antarctica, can still very much affect it. So let's use the power of our everyday choices to limit our impact. We can do this by reducing or stopping our use of plastics and products using microplastics. We can ensure that we only buy fish from sustainable fisheries. We can lower our carbon footprint by walking, cycling or carpooling to school, buying secondhand clothes and supporting local. What other choices do you think we can make to help protect the Antarctic? Being one of the original 12 signatories of the Antarctic Treaty, South Africa has had a presence on the Antarctic continent since 1960. The current South African base, Sanai 4, was established in 1997 in Queen Maudland, part of the eastern region of Antarctica. Weirdly enough, due to, the, due to continental drift, the gigantic outcrop of rock upon which the base is perched is in fact Karoo Dolerite. Sitting at 71 degrees south, 2 degrees west, South Africa's research station is made up of three linked double-story modules on stilts anchored to the underlying rock to prevent sinking. A revolutionary design used in the building of subsequent bases by other countries. All refuse is sorted, crushed and sealed in empty fuel drums for return to South Africa. The base is crewed year, year round by an overwintering team of 10 people made up of a doctor and a collection of engineers and scientists. The SA Agullis II is an impressive polar supply ship that was commissioned in 2012 to take over from the SA Agullis. She is a multi-purpose ship that carries out the ro roles of research vessel, passenger ship, cargo carrier, icebreaker, helicopter carrier, and oil tanker. She supports our Antarctic base as well as the research stations on Marion and Gough Islands in the sub-Antarctic. Sub Eight permanent labs and six portable container labs allow scientists from a range of fields to carry out research while at sea. Her bow and stern thrusters together with her multi-directional propellers and computer-controlled positioning system, allow her to hold a position with incredible accuracy for hours, even in bad weather. Her mechanics also allow her to move sideways so that she can sample in consolidated ice. The moon pool, one of my favorite beaches, is a shaft that opens up in the center of the ship. It descends down through three decks and the hull of the ship to allow scientists to sample during bad weather when it's too dangerous to lower equipment over the side of the ship and while in thick ice. Various other pieces of equipment such as the bongo net for plankton sampling, Newston net for microplastic collection and the CTD to test different aspects of the water column can be lowered down over the side. Wave gliders, sail boys and sail drones can also be deployed and recovered. With a maximum expedition length of 90 days, the ship is designed to spend 300 days of the year at sea. I have been down to the Antarctic ice twice and I will go again in a heartbeat. I love the cold, the vast open spaces, the stormy seas, the incredible creatures and the emptiness. My first expedition was back in the winter of 2016 as part of the Seamaster program. This program introduces the field of marine science to postgraduate students while at sea. I was working at the, depart the then Department of Environmental Affairs at the time and was on board as a seabird observer. I spent two weeks at, the, at sea and reached the, the Antarctic MIZ, the marginal ice zone, where sea ice was collected for sampling. It was such a special time and I loved being at sea. One of my absolute favorite highlights was watching the soaring albatross glide seemingly effortlessly through storms, such beautiful, powerful birds. 
I could watch them for hours, which I did. Being a seabird observer, you're out on deck in all weather conditions and work can shift throughout the daylight hours. The, daylight, the data I collected is contributed to BirdLife South Africa's Atlas of Seabirds at Sea project. My other favorite moment was seeing the ice for the first time, which we reached at night. It glows in the moonlight and this was made even more special by the appearance of a snow petrel out of the darkness. As I've mentioned, it's a special kind of cold down there, one which I'm eternally drawn to. In the spring of 2019, I was given the honor by BirdLife South Africa to participate as a seabird observer in scale expedition. The Southern Ocean seasonal experiment works towards providing a greater understanding of the seasonal cycle of the Southern Ocean through chemical, physical, geological, biological sampling. For six weeks, I formed part of a top predator group, which also included whale and seal biologists. We reached 60 degrees south and then moved east through the pack ice, surveying seals and penguins before heading back west while carrying out a whale census. Being in the ice is absolutely surreal. This white expanse has completely captivated me. Two of my highlights from this trip include spotting and watching a blue whale move beneath the ice flows and watching a leopard seal nurse her pup. This trip I was introduced to blizzards and whiteouts and even got to experience frost nip while out watching emperor penguins and not being properly dressed. No gloves, hat, one pair of socks, in jeans, a bit ridiculous really. These experiences have only increased my fascination and love for this extraordinary continent. You should now be able to answer most of these questions. These quizzes along with others are available for download on the lockdown learning page of my website. You are able to walk through the Sanai 4 base in a 360 degree tour of this research station. You can visually experience what life is like in the cold wilds of Antarctica, and you can even see how the SA Gullis II was built. These links, along with those below, are available under Lesson 2 on the Lockdown Learning page of my website. So my website is scientistinlimbo.com, and if you select the Lockdown Learning tab, you will find loads of ocean-based activities, crafts, and learning resources. I've under the articles tab, you can also read all about my Antarctic adventures. I've included these links just to make it a bit easier on the lockdown learning page under lesson two. You can also participate in an array of citizen science projects on Zooniverse. So to end off, I have two activities for you. You have been chosen to be part of an overwintering team so you will be spending a year in Antarctica at the Sanai 4 base. What are you going to pack? There are no shops or online deliveries, so think about what you will need to survive for the whole year. And how much of each item will you need? Don't forget the snacks. I do wonder what a year's supply of chocolate looks like. <laughs> Yum. During your year in the Antarctic, you discover a species that is brand new to science, and you need to share your findings with the world. Make accurate scientific drawings of your species and show how it is adapted to the Antarctic conditions. All questions, quiz answers, drawings and lists can be emailed to me at guardiansofthedeep at yahoo.com. Next week, we will explore kelp forests. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the icy cold wilds of Antarctica. See you next week. Bye.